Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. I am excited to be here today with someone who's been with us once before. This is Dr. Fred Cohen. Hi, Dr. Cohen. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. Dr. Cohen is an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and a headache specialist. He is here today because we have a really interesting topic that I think many of us have heard of, but we might not know much about it. It's a controversial one. Today, we're going to talk about ketamine. Ketamine is a medication pre prescribed to people with migraine and other headache disorders and pain disorders. It's often reserved for people who are chronic and refractory, uh, and in cases where, cases, excuse me, where the patient has been failed by multiple acute and preventive medications. Um, we are going to start by having Dr. Cohen just let us know what he loves about headache medicine and who he is. So let me give him a chance to tell us that. Go ahead, Dr. Cohen. Thank you. So I'm a headache medicine specialist at Mount Sinai. And you know what I love about this, what brought me in is you know, since I can remember, I had a migraine, but I had no idea what I had. I had this bad headache my whole life. And then I, when I was in medical school and we had a lecture on migraine, and I was like, hey, I think that's what I have. And then in residency, I found headache medicine specialists. I got good treatment from one, and now I became one. So sort of this nice full circle. Okay. I love that story. Um, why don't we start by just go ahead and we'll just address why is ketamine so controversial? Sure. So ketamine has a very interesting history. You know, ketamine was, you know, actually sort of made as a replacement for PCP. PCP was invented as a, as an anesthetic, but it was found not to be good. And so, you know, during the fifties and sixties, a lot of chemists were looking to make new anesthetics. And in 1962 was, you know, ketamine was invented. And the first descriptions of it was that uh, the patient's, where it was actually tested on prisoners, uh, reported that they felt that they were floating in outer space and had no feelings. They seemed disconnected. Um, mm -hmm. And then it actually was first used as a veterinarian anesthetic, you know, and I think, you know, maybe that's why it's referred to as a horse tranquilizer. And it wasn't until the okay. 70s when it actually got FDA approved for human use. Um, and then in the 70s, it became used as an anesthetic in academic centers and psychiatric centers. But then in the 80s, it became a party drug. Later in mm -hmm. the 90s, it then got classified as a controlled substance. Um, so, you know, similar with, you know, marijuana and psilocybin that we're finding medical use for these, but they're controlled substances. Ketamine sort of has found itself in a similar, you know, point. Okay. So now we know there's controversy, not every physician or, you know, everyone is obviously prescribing it or, or you know, believes in it and, you know, wants to work with it, et cetera. But there's definitely controversy out there. So we've addressed why that is. Let's talk about why it works or how, let's say, how does it work for people sure. with migraine? So first I want to mention, you know, ketamine, you know, if people think as, at least in, as physicians, when we hear about ketamine, what you learn in medical school, or at least when I was in medical school, is it's used mm -hmm. in anesthesiology, meaning when you're going, you know, into a procedure. And what mm -hmm. we're talking about today is ketamine in sort of a smaller dose. You know, this is not the same as you would undergo if you're having a procedure, if you're going to be unconscious. So ketamine is thought to mitigate pain in various ways. You know, this is what I like to call a dirty treatment. And dirty meaning that, you know, it touches a lot of different areas versus a drug that would touch one specific thing. You know, we know mm -hmm. ketamine works on opioid receptors. We know ketamine works on NMDA, you know, uh, channel receptors. Uh, and from other migraine studies, we know NMDA receptors are involved in the whole migraine, you know, uh, cycle and excitability. We know ketamine also interacts with the uh, glutamate transmission. Glutamate uh, is known, uh, think of it as, you know, neuron nerve excitability. So, you know, turning that down and sort of is in the whole how we feel pain migraine cycle. So ketamine works on these various areas, um, not just specifically one. Okay. So that is a very interesting way of explaining it. I love the word dirty. We have a number of medications that people use that adjective for, meaning it's not a targeted treatment for one mm -hmm. specific thing in your body. Um, so there are various ketamine protocols. In other words, there are various ways to administer ketamine. 
various um, ways to go about this. Let's start with that. Which one should we start with? So ketamine can be given in a number of different ways. You know, there's infusion, right. IV, there's intramuscular, there's intranasal, you know, given with a nasal applicator, there's oral, sublingual, there's even rectal. And, you know, what we, I guess in the refractory, headache refractory migraine treatments, you know, it's given in either an infusion or given intranasally. So let's start by talking about the infusions, IV infusions of ketamine, because I think often in the migraine space, when we've heard about it, it's because we heard of someone that went um, and got an in ketamine infusion somewhere, maybe at a center because they were so refractory. Um, so, so can we talk about the infusion protocols? Is there more than one IV infusion protocol? So there are, you know, I break it down in what I call outpatient and inpatient. Outpatient meaning that it's for a few hours and you go home, where inpatient, you're actually staying overnight. So mm -hmm. outpatient is more common. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of city centers in us in around the country that they are these centers that offer to have a ketamine infusion uh, for typically four hours long. And they can be done anywhere from one to five days consecutively. Um, and then after the four hours, you go home, whereas an inpatient protocol, you are actually staying um, at, the, at the center. Generally, this is at a hospital, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a, you're having continuous ketamine, and that's generally for five days. So my, my experience comes from inpatient infusion. You know, I trained at, um, my headache medicine training came from uh, uh, the Jefferson Headache Center, where they uh, do a five-day uh, ketamine infusion. I uh, generally stay for the whole time. Some people, you know, some people do leave sooner than that, but it's generally for a strict five days. Okay. Um, so how effective, let's, let's start with this five days. How effective is this usually? How many people actually feel better afterwards? So there, as far as numbers, that is limited. There's only so many studies that have been done with ketamine um, inpatient infusions. I do know, like, for a, a study that was done with 77 patients, 55 or so 71% reported a reduction in their pain. On a scale of 1 to 10, they had a 2 point or greater reduction. And a quarter of those 27 patients then reported that at their follow visit later on, that they further had this decrease in pain. Um, and uh, anecdotally, I would say most patients do feel an improvement and that they have uh, a reduction in their pain and whatnot. How long does it last varies from patient to patient. Um, and uh, that, uh, that could differ, you know, and I tell patients generally that, you know, most of the time you will feel a difference, but how long does it last? That is going to be unique to, you know, unique to everybody. Right. That was going to be my next question is, if you are someone who responds to IV ketamine therapy, how often do people usually end up getting it? So that, you know, varies a lot as well. And first I'll say, well, did you did have someone going from, of course, the five day course to having it once or twice, you know, have a different prolonging effect. I know there are some patients that do, you know, an outpatient infusion, maybe one or uh, one or two days in a row, maybe let's say every six months or a year. As far as the inpatient infusion, some people just have it once. There are some patients that come for a second infusion, maybe down the road a year or so later, you know, um, or some may need a third sometime even after that. You know, that varies as well. Um, but, you know, it's not something that I would say is a one and done. Like patients can get okay. a repeat, you know, ketamine infusion. Um, but as far as how, uh, how much they get, how often they get it, you know, I think there are a lot of factors that go in other condition they have, you know, other, you know, the qualities of the headache, et cetera. Okay. What are the side effects of IV ketamine therapy? So while ketamine can be effective reducing pain, there are some, you know, potential side effects that got to be taken in consideration. The most well-known one um, is ketamine can sort of do what we call this ketamine emergence phenomenon, this dissociative effect. And that could be anywhere from 10 to 20% of patients getting ketamine. Like earlier, I was saying that that first trial, patients talked about that, well, I should say subjects talked about that they felt that they were floating in outer space, they were disconnected with their bodies. You know, there's a lot of reports of this constellation of symptoms, such as delirium, hallucinations, very vivid dreams, you know. Um, and this, you know, when happening to a severe degree, there's a, you know, there's a 
common colloquial term of uh, a K hole, you know, that patients feel that they're sort of floating away. So that could mm -hmm. certainly happen, you know, and it's something we definitely, you know, all these side effects I'm going to talk about stuff we, we, we monitor, you know, very closely for. Ketamine right. could have effect on blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, it can cause uh, an elevation of liver enzymes. It can affect the liver in that way. Usually self-limited, but chronic use, it could do more, you know, lasting damage to that. We know that right. ketamine could have effects on the urinary system. It could, you know, um, cause cystitis, inflammation of the bladder. It could cause this, uh, you know, pain with urination. We do, uh, there are high concentrations of ketamine metabolites, the byproducts that go through the urine. Um, so, you know, kidney function, you know, uh, uh, heart function, cardiovascular function, um, you know, those things need to be monitored. Okay. So we've talked about IV infusions, short, short term ones, meaning outpatient ones, long term ones. Um, let's move on to ketamine nasal spray. What kind of patient, what are the indications for ketamine na nasal spray? So ketamine nasal spray, um, is for as far as direct in, uh, uh, I want to say there's direct indications per se, in my experience of using it, generally when someone, mm -hmm. again, I've done, I've done the inpatient, uh, the five day course, if someone responds quite well to it, then I bring it up to them. Like, you know, you've responded well to this kind of medication. There's thing about at home version to use, and this is giving as a rescue medication. Um, ketamine mm -hmm. nasal spray, uh, I prescribed it as a 30 milliliter bottle, um, and it could be used three sprays, um, three sprays at a time, three times a day, max of three days a week. And um, that it, it doesn't have to be used as much as that, but it would caution that, you know, it shouldn't be uh, more than that for, you know, it, there is a concern of it could be a drug of abuse and this is a controlled substance. Patients actually, when we've given it, they have to sign a ketamine treatment agreement that they're aware that, you know, this is a, you know, a restricted drug and that, you know, to not use it past that recommendation. Mm -hmm. So now I think this is a really important question because you just said all these side effects of IV ketamine and now it's in a nose spray and people are taking it home. What are the side effects of ketamine nose spray? Can people drive after they've used it, et cetera? I would not recommend driving after this. It's, okay. you know, just as, you know, obviously yeah. it's not as potent as getting the infusion. Right. You know, it's still ketamine. It, it, is, it, can, it is a sedating drug, you know, as mm -hmm. I discussed you know, delirium can happen. So no, I don't recommend driving or operate heavy machinery. You know, this is something <laughs> right. um, in, a, in a setting you're not, you know, that you're not doing something like that. It could definitely right. be so this is, so you're, you're going to feel lucky if nothing, if you haven't responded to anything else, but this is not exactly a medication that's going to get you back to work or make you functional in your day. This is more of a just kill the pain and you're at home type medicine, right? Right. I wouldn't recommend, like, I, I know some patients who are able to function, but yes, like this is, okay. you know, definitely is commonly sedating. Okay. Um, so is there anything we've missed on this very important discussion that I think is often not brought up in the community because it's kind of controversial? Um, what have we missed? Is there anything you'd like to add on the topic of ketamine? There is something I want to add going back to, you know, asking about how long does ketamine last for one topic I wanted to bring up is where I think uh, these infusions have use is when, you know, refractory migraine has other components to it, such as medication overuse headache. Medication overuse headache, unfortunately, is common in, you know, uh, patients with chronic migraine, um, refractory migraine, that when you use an acute me medication too much, it can sort of, you can think of it as transforming the headache, another mm -hmm. headache component to your migraine, you know, that's already there. And doing these infusions, you know, coming at least for an inpatient infusion, and you have this five-day course where you're not getting those other acute medications, you're getting the ketamine, you're able to get pain relief, and it's able to get you off these other medications and sort of think of it as a bridging tool. You know, I've had patients that, you know, they're having a daily refractory headache, they're taking triptans or neuroleptics or other classes of drugs, you know, constantly, and it's sort of in this perpetual cycle. Come for a ketamine infusion, you know, they're able to get pain relief, they get all these medications, and you could think of it as giving other medications a chance to work. You know, let's mm -hmm. say you're on, let's say you have chronic migraine, and you're on Botox, for example, this is actually I had a case, you know, before that, a patient that was, you know, we had on ketamine, got them off their other acute medications, and they were able to then go on Botox successfully getting, you know, an FDA approved chronic migraine treatment. And with that medication overuse component, you know, now, uh, now 
eliminated the other preventative treatments now have a chance to have more, you know, effect to have more success. Um, and then, you know, a point I sort of want to, you know, I guess end on and point out um, is uh, ketamine definitely has its use, it definitely has its purpose, especially right. you know, refractory migraine is a very difficult thing, hence in the name, you know, patients who unfortunately, you know, they have such a, you know, high, you know, pain severity, high burden, you know, how can we get these people to be pain free and sort of back into having their lives back? And I think ketamine definitely has use there. Um, and, but there's, um, I, I do have patients coming in asking about it, asking for it. And, and I say this for all treatments, every headache is unique. Every migraine is unique. I tell it to all my patients, what works for someone else might not work for you. What works for you might not work for someone else, you know? Um, and there's concern that this could be a drug of abuse. You know, as I said, when patients get intranasal ketamine, there's an agreement that they have to sign and understand that. Mm -hmm. And I, I have seen, unfortunately, the, you know, the bad side of ketamine. When ketamine, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, this is in nasal form, when ketamine given too much, you know, I've seen patients with kidney damage, I've seen patients with, you know, uh, with liver damage as well. And it makes me think of that, you know, the opioid crisis, you know, that was, you know, still going on a major thing. And it makes me, you know, sort of, you know, cautious, like, let's not follow in the footsteps we did before, leading to, God forbid, a ketamine crisis, that there needs to be restraint, you know, sort of rules in place, um, the, you know, avoid going down that road. But again, you know, I, I talked about a lot of negative, I do think ketamine has promised, I do think ketamine definitely has a role for treating refractory pain, refractory migraine. Okay, I have an interesting question that I just thought of while you were talking, because Ketamine is so often used for chronic pain that's not migraine pain. And these days when we test a migraine specific medication, we are often looking at other migraine symptoms. What is what is your most bother bothersome system, excuse me, symptom? Is it nausea, vomiting, phonophobia, photophobia, et cetera, or is it a vestibular sy sy symptom? Um, I'm curious, do we have any indication? When people are using, for example, the ketamine no, no spray as an acute medication, are we also able to stop some of these other symptoms? Are we able to stop the entire process? Or is it just this single symptom of pain that we are dealing with when uh, we, are, we are helping people with ketamine? So I can only talk anecdotally, you know, to my knowledge, there isn't data on assessing ketamine's relief for the most bothersome symptom. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, patients who are successful with ketamine, like it's sort of, I almost want to say all or none, that, you know, okay. patients who have, you know, you know, success using it, that the migraine cycle is afforded, that also there may be the photophobia, right. their nausea also is relieved. Um, I, to, you know, in the patients I've treated, I haven't had a patient who their pain's gone, but they're still very nauseous, or right. they, you know, they have a lot of sound sensitivity or light sensitivity. You know, again, I don't have numbers for that. And I, to my knowledge, I don't think there's a study that sort of assessed that specifically. You know, the studies that have been done specifically have looked at pain severity. Um, there is actually one study that looked at aura as a whole. It didn't look at pain severity. It only looked at aura, aura mm -hmm. severity. And that did show that, you know, aura severity did improve. Um, but okay. again, pain was not measured in that study. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much for being here. This was thank such an interesting... Here episode. I really enjoyed talking to you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And please join us for the next episode of Headwise.